Hello and welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo, back for episode 176. Football is back at all levels. Last week we talked uh, about some NAI football, had a lot of great week zero action in D2 football, but now the slate is complete. Division Three football back in action, some great D3 football on today's episode. And uh, we'll have a great D3 guest as well, Carson Bordo from Johns Hopkins, the man who had the game ceiling interception in their win over Ithaca and the Bombers up there in upstate New York. He'll join me here shortly on this episode. Otherwise, though, we've got a Division Two squad upsetting an FCS opponent in week one, that was uh, actually quite the surprise to me. Definitely got to talk about Edinburgh, the squad down there. How about the first ever win for a brand new Division Three football program? The Calvin Knights put up a 50-piece in their first ever win slash game in general. Those are all really exciting storylines. Otherwise, got a great D1, D3, or D1. That's not the name of the show. D2, D3, NAI recap for week one across all levels. Jimmy Martin, Matt Schwarzler back joining me respectively on both of those Really, really, really good stuff tonight. I'm excited about it. Before we get into any of it, though, let's take a look at our players of the week. If you don't follow us on the socials, first of all, what are you doing? But uh, nonetheless, let's take a look at these guys. How about Ethan Champney from Michigan Tech? 10 receptions, 227 yards, and two tuds. He led the Huskies in a four-overtime win against South Dakota Mines. That was one of our uh, Game of the Week selections. That's an incredible stat line. We go out on the list, though. Defensively, from Minot State, Nalu Cordero. Hopefully pronouncing that one correctly. The defensive back had five tackles, but he had two interceptions. Both of them returned for touchdowns. For the Beavers in their week one matchup. That was impressive. And then the special team side of things. Blake Dowd, the punter from Colorado Mines. Four punts with an average of 50 yards. One of them went for 80 yards. He literally flipped the field for the ore diggers. Those are some pretty exciting stats from the D2 slate. Down to the D3 level. Had him on the show last week. He had a hell of a game. Caleb Blaha, 27 for 39. 426 and five touchdowns combined through the air, on the ground. This guy got it done for River Falls and their big time win over Alma. We'll talk about that in the episode later. Moving on to the defensive side, Andrew Nordland from Aurora. 18 tackles, 13 of those being solo and an interception in there. The Spartans week one matchup. How about that? And on the special team side of things, Andre Green from Gaudette. They had a big time win. A two kick returns, 130 yards, and a touchdown for the Bison. Love to see that. Finally, on the NAIA side, we take a look at Sam Tumulty here. 15 for 17, incredibly efficient. The St. Francis signal caller, 350 yards and four touchdowns combined for him in week one. Defensively, Nehemiah Figueroa, 12 tackles. Not one, not two, but three interceptions in the safety from McPherson. A touchdown, he returned one of those for six for the Bulldogs. And finally, Alex Hansen, the kicker from Reinhardt, was two for two. Had a long of 47 yards in the Eagles game in week one. Two for two on the PATs. Shout out to those guys in our Players of the Week. If you want to submit names for those, we put them out every, I mean, Saturday night, Sunday morning. You'll see a post from us in the College Football Network that collaborate on those. So appreciate you guys who do submit those names. You really just want to highlight a lot of these top performances. It gets harder every week. This week was so ridiculously hard to try and decide. We do our best. But as always, you can watch this episode on YouTube if you are watching. Hello, don't forget about the video chapters below. Fast forward to any part of the conversation that sounds remotely interesting. Otherwise, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Follow us on those socials. Please leave a like, subscribe, maybe tell your brother, your friend, your sister, your mother, your father, your grandparents. Do me a favor. Tell somebody about the show today. I appreciate you. I appreciate you a lot. Let's get into the guest conversation with the defensive back from Johns Hopkins, Carson Bordeaux. Join the show tonight. The man is a back-to-back intramural champion, but we've got him on here to talk about the Blue Jays, for which he plays defensive back from Johns Hopkins, Carson Bordeaux. What's up, man? Uh, What's up? I'm appreciative. I appreciate you having me. Um, Looking forward to being on the show. Dude, pumped to to have you on here. What are we winning those uh, IM championships in, and how many football guys are on that team? Basketball, back-to-back, led by our, our defensive coordinator, defensive back coach, Coach Hill. You're joking. Um, yeah, no, he's a, our starting point guard. Um, entire <laughs> team is made up of football guys, so it's a, it's a good time. It's fun. That is incredible. Do you guys get – is there a big trophy, maybe like a WWE-type title belt, anything of the sort? Not a, 
not a big trophy, but we got the we got the okay. shirts. Yep. Hold we got on. the yep. shirts every single year. So that's good. Yeah. What kind yeah. of what kind of logo is that? Is that like a like official retro logo or what do we got going on? Yeah, it's a Nag J. So I guess I like you could that. say like a official, but like the cartoon cartoon blue J. Pretty cool. I like that a lot, man. Um, now, like I said, we're here, though, to talk about this game versus Ithaca. And Jimmy and I, you know, we're going to talk about it later in the episode here. We had said last week that, um, you know, definitely had you guys favored, but this was obviously going to be a close matchup. I was talking about how Ithaca's going to need to have a turnover here, a takeaway there, kind of maybe Lady Luck on her side, obviously at the at-home atmosphere to make things shake. It was very much you guys on the back foot, quote-unquote, uh, early in this one, 17 nothing, man. I mean, you guys get punched in the mouth. We saw how you responded, of course, but talk to me about what happened early. Yeah, I mean, Ithaca is a great team, and they came out with a great game plan. Um, and they definitely got us at the start, and we didn't come out the way we should have. And yeah, that was completely on us, but they're a great team, and they did exactly what their game plan was. And once we made adjustments to it and kind of took a step back and took a couple – deep breaths and we got back into it and we were all good but I mean they're a great team so we knew they were going to come out firing from the gate and they did just that what do you think of that uh environment up there I mean again we had talked earlier you've been up there before but Butterfield man what was it like playing in that environment home opener for the Bombers as well place had to be I'm sure pretty rocking yeah no it was a great environment um they had a a pretty packed stadium they were chirping pretty good so it was uh (laughs) it was definitely fun to be up there um Definitely got the emotions fired up a little bit. So um, we just had to, like I said, just take a step back and realize we're playing football, just block out all the noise and just get back to doing what we do. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, they weren't the only ones doing a little chirping. You seal the deal with the interception late there. Walk over to the sideline. Walk me through that play. And uh, what kind of shit are we talking over there? (laughs) Um, Not much. Not much. Um, (laughs) Good answer. Good answer. Didn't need to after the game was over. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just a little cover two. He threw it right to me, and, um, yeah, didn't need to say anything. Right place, right just time, a, or what? Yeah, right place, right time, yep. Talk to me about the, the hoodie out the back, too. That doesn't bother you while you're playing? I feel like I could have never, never pulled that off or done that. No, yeah, you can, you can t- kind of tell it's there sometimes, but uh, – me and a few of my other buddies, we enjoy it. I think it looks somewhat cool. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Um, but uh, now we we like we like rocking it, so it's it's fun. I like that. And uh, you guys now two and zero all time versus uh, versus Ithaca. The first game obviously being played last year. That matchup becoming one of the most entertaining to watch, at least from a uh, you know a, a consumer standpoint. What have you appreciated maybe about that opposing sideline that they've been able to bring the last two years and, and kind of built up the hype around this game? I mean, yeah, they're some great players. Um, and they they don't have years where they're off or anything. They're a great program, so they reload every single year, bring new guys in that can just pick up the slack where, right where they left it off. Um, so it's an absolute ball game every single time. Um, we expect that every single time we play them, we're going to get their best game. And they got some dogs over there, so it's a it's a great atmosphere, like I said earlier, and it's a great team. So um, it's a just a great matchup between two good teams. And to talk about your squad more specifically, what does it say about you guys, you know, to come in there and have a big-time bounce-back win against a nationally ranked opponent in week one? Because I think we've talked about with other guys, too. It's one thing to do that in week seven or week eight, week nine. It's a totally another thing to do that in week one where you're still trying to figure out all these pieces, especially offensively, you know, to come behind from a deficit like that. What does it say about the resiliency of this group? Yeah, I think this team's uh... – I think this team's special just because we have a lot of guys returning. So we've been in spots like this before. Um, but with that said, we never lost an ounce of confidence. Whether it was defensively, we knew the offense was going to pick us up. Offensively, we knew – or offensively, they knew the defense would pick them up. So whenever us as a defense went on the field, it was just, hey, three and out, get the offense their ball. They're going to take care of their job. Same thing with the offense. They were like, hey, our, the defense has our back. All we got to do is go put some points up, and we're going to be in good shape. So like I said, we were – Never not confident about the outcome of the game. We just had to settle down and play our game. But it was a, it was an absolute riot. Well said, brother. Well said. And uh, I'm assuming you guys all have seen and heard this news about uh, Carnegie Mellon joining the, uh, the conference over there, huh? 
Yeah, just saw it today. That's exciting stuff. Pretty, exciting. pretty ridiculous, and the big shakeup in the world of D three football. What was the the general reaction from from you and the guys hearing that? Not much, honestly. Um, all kind of surprised, but um, honestly, we're just looking at it day by day, week by week. So, um, all of our hey, focus right now is just yeah. All of our focus right now is just on Christopher Newport and. Uh, whatever happens next year is a long way away. So we're just taking this day by day and going to get after it tomorrow morning. Hell yeah. Talk to me about the captains. What do you know you have to prepare for them this coming week on the road? Yeah, I mean, great team. It's going to be a great environment. They're returning a lot of guys from last year. And obviously last year was a close game as well. Um, so we're expecting their best game. And we got to, like I said earlier, just take it day by day, get better each and every day. And uh, uh, we'll we'll see when Saturday comes around. But we're excited for it. Yeah, I'll tell you right right now, brother, you're going to get everyone's best uh, every week, especially after a performance like that, especially following a year that you guys have last year. Uh, you bring back some big pieces from that squad. feels like the experience and confidence go hand in hand over there for the Blue Jays. Is that kind of what the feeling is around that roster? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say we're a confident team. Um, like I said earlier, we return a lot of guys on defense, a lot of guys on offense, a lot of production. So we've, uh, unlike last year, we've all been in many situations and we've, played in many games together so um like I said we have the utmost confidence in each other but with that said we still got a long way to go still got to get a lot better so we're just looking forward to getting after it tomorrow morning getting better amen and I for one am looking forward to continue to follow along with you guys Carson I appreciate you man that's all I got for you tonight brother thank you so much for having me I really appreciate it of course have a good rest of your night appreciate it thank you all right, let's get into the D2 slate. Starting things off, Emporia State, the Hornets hosting the Rams from Angelo State. And the Hornets, they take this one 17-12. to Not quite the offensive performance that we've come to expect from this Emporia squad. But again, we're talking about an Angelo State team that has had one of the best defensive secondaries in the Lone Star and honestly in the country the last couple of seasons. So maybe we should have not expected a, a great offensive performance. The Rams actually started things off 6-0 in the first quarter. They went into halftime up nine to seven in a very low scoring affair but Emporia a score and a field goal in the second half ended up taking this one over they had uh, still quite a bit of success through the air though don't let the score uh, fool you here Gunnar Gundy the guy we've talked about under center for the Hornets 25 for 39 252 and two tuds did have two interceptions this Rams secondary coming up big making some plays uh, for them late in this one really struggled on the ground averaging just over a yard per carry where the Hornets Hornets, whereas uh, the Rams had a little bit better success running the ball. Defensively, though, I think that's where uh, these squads definitely stepped up. Emporia had quite a few guys getting into the backfield, had five or six different guys all listed for TFLs. Leading them onto the day was uh, Sage Pierda. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correctly. 11 tackles and half a TFL there. Uh, a lot of different guys registering some PBUs and things for the Hornets. And... Um, you know, for as well as that defensive secondary played for Angelo State, only got to the quarterback one time, but had uh, those two interceptions, which really helped. They just weren't able to generate, it seemed like, a whole lot of pressure throughout this one. Nonetheless, big-time win for Emporia, and uh, as they move on throughout this season, they are currently sit at 2-0. and They get right into the heart of MIAA play. You're at Pittsburgh State, back at home versus Missouri Western, and then on the road at Northwest Missouri. A gauntlet of the next three weeks for the Hornets. We will certainly see what they're made of soon enough. Now, the team that I'm excited to talk about tonight, a Division II squad going on the road and winning at a D1 FCS opponent. That would be, out of the PSAC, Edinburgh going to Robert Morris and picking up the win, they finished with the final of 23-21 to and what was a great contest Saturday night. Here's a couple just photos from the games. I couldn't find uh, any video highlights out there, but man, this one was a pretty exciting one. You went to halftime tied up at 14 apiece. The Scots definitely holding their own when you look at a, a breakdown of the box score here. They held their quarterback for Robert Morris, 14-21 of for 111 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. A very, very meager stat line when it comes to uh, offensive projections there. Some great shots of the celebration 
of the Scots in the stadium. A hell of a win for them, especially when you look at this squad and what they've uh, you know struggled to do already this season. They're coming off a tough loss at home in their home opener against East Stroudsburg, which we know East Stroudsburg, the Warriors there, are going to feel the really good football team. They're going on the road next week at Kutztown. We're really going to see what this uh, Edinburgh team is made of. But um, otherwise, looking at, I guess, this game in particular... Not anything too crazy coming out of the passing attack. Tegan Brown did have 80 uh, 80 yards on eight catches and a touchdown. That was big time for them. But again, getting into the backfield and making plays, that was the name of the game for the Scots in this one. They had one, two, three, four, five, six different players register for TFLs. Wilfredo Diaz had 16 tackles, two of them behind the line of scrimmage uh, for Edinburgh in this one. That was was a big-time part of this. How about Tristan uh, Waldier, looks like? He had five tackles. One of those is a sack and forced a fumble on the day. So turnovers, forced a fumble, had an interception. That's exactly how you're going to stay in these kind of games. And uh, Edinburgh did exactly that, went on the road and picked up a uh, a very quality win against a good uh, Division I opponent. So shout-out to those guys. Wanted to make sure I mentioned that. We can move on to the NSIC, where we'll be staying for uh, just a little bit here, talking about this Minot State squad, and maybe we—you uh, heard a little bit of the video. I'm gonna—I'm gonna play here in a second. Maybe we haven't talk, talked enough about this Minot State, State squad. Excuse me, the Beavers running a, a variation of the triple option that's really exciting to watch. If you're, I mean, a sicko and like that kind of football, like myself, 42 to nine over Southwest Minnesota State, the Beavers getting things done. When you look at the stats. In, uh, in this one, you would think a team running the triple option, they would have a little bit more of uh, explosive numbers. Might not rush for 200 yards, which is not a lot considering they only passed for 30. What you have to understand, though, we talked about the players of the week earlier. They had a player on their defense that had two interceptions returned for touchdowns. That's where you get some of those big-time points. Southwest actually outrushed them on the day, 241 yards at 202. But again, when you have two takeaways that end up turning into points, that's big time for Minot State. This is the reaction from the locker room post game from a Minot State Beaver squad that is now two and zero. Oh. Love to see that for those guys and a team in the NSIC that, again, we really haven't talked about a whole lot on this show because, I mean, to be honest with you, we just haven't had a whole lot of reasons to talk about them. We've been talking about the top half of this conference for a long time and we'll continue to do so, but it looks like this year could potentially be the year that Minot State punches through and earns themselves a seat at the table, if you will. Um, But looking at the schedule here, as it concerns the next couple weeks, they have their homecoming game this coming weekend against Northern State, and then they go at Mankato. So it's going to be some really telling tales the next two weeks here for this Minot squad. Can they continue to have this dominance on the ground, this rushing attack, and their defense continue to step up? Who knows? Another point for the Minot State squad over there, something totally unrelated to the game. How about their brand new weight room for the Beavers? That looks pretty incredible. I was actually, I was genuinely pretty blown away by this. How customized it is. You can see the kind of the turf, uh, strip of turf behind it as well. There's another great wide shot. Custom racks and everything. There's a good shot of the turf. A nice wide piece of turf, enough that you could actually do some good agilities or maybe some sled pushes, things of that nature on that strip of turf. Wanted to make mention of that. It's a really good upgrade to their facilities over there in Minot. Now, let's move down the list. We've got, if you follow us on the socials, you've already seen a lot from this game. Number 20, Bemidji State. They go into number 8, Minnesota State. The Mavericks pull out a 31-29 victory at home over the Beavers. This one was ridiculous. And I think, you know what? I think let's work our way backwards in this one. Talking about it. This was back and forth. I was tuned in for the entirety of it. And I would like to listen to the call of the actual kick that won the game for Mankato to start things off here. Taking their time, snap is high, kick is up by Jager, the kick is up, the kick is good! Minnesota State with the walk-off winner, Jager. So awesome. 32 yards out in Minnesota State. The team with the ball last wins this one, 31-29. Matthew Jager, you are the hero tonight. 
Matthew Jayer, you heard him say it right there. Big time field goal. The guy steps up in the biggest of moments and wins it at the end of regulation. He was not the only one that stepped up in this one. We posted a wide receiver comparison on our Instagram. The two guys that got it done being Treshawn Watson for Mankato and Bu uh, Bryce or Bubba Peters, as uh, some of his handles go for Bemidji. Look at the stat comparison here. Treshawn, five catches, 107 yards, three touchdowns. Bryce Peters, seven catches, 108 yards, three touchdowns. Back and forth, both these guys making plays, play after play for their respective teams. They made this game so incredibly fun to watch, and now we can uh, take a chance to look at all three of the touchdowns. Or, I mean, maybe I'll pull up all three of them from Treshawn. Here is uh, the first of the three from the Mankato wideout that Time had quite the execute. breakout performance. You'll see here as I lower the volume. This might be featured by Randy Moss on You Got Moss. He's up there at the top right of your screen right there. Watch this catch. Third down and goal. Mavericks down by two, 9-7. Two receivers near side. Eckering going to lob it up on the far side. Jump ball is a cut. Touchdown, touchdown. Is that Watson? I think Watson in the corner. On that play that, uh... I've seen it before, and I'll watch it again, and every time it's it's disgusting. It's absolutely ridiculous. The fact there's humans out there, especially the D2 level, that can go over someone's back and take a ball away from them just like this is awesome. I love that for the sport and for our level of football. We can uh, continue, though, and keep watching some more of these scores from Mankato. How about uh, another one from Treshawn here? In the third quarter, Mavericks down a point. Eckern drops back, finds him deep over the middle for what really on the outside looks like a very easy score. He was not done on the night. He actually even had one more score that we'll take a look at here. This one coming in the fourth quarter. Once again, Mavericks trailing by one. I'll let you listen in to the call on this one. BSU up by a point, 22-21. They're going to fake the handoff. Eckern back to pass. Got a guy wide open. It's Watson again across the 20. 15. No one's going to touch on the third touchdown of the night for Treshawn Watson. Have a night, Treshawn. Absolutely ridiculous performance. Shout out to you and that Mankato squad. Just a ridiculous way to start the year with not one but two ranked wins, right? They went on the road last week and got a quality win against the Northwest Missouri State team. You come back home, your quarterback and Hayden Eckern, 20 for 37, maybe not the most efficient, but 278 yards and three touchdowns through the air. Had a little bit of success on the ground, maybe not as much as that Mankato squad would like. Still missing uh, Sheen Butler Lawson from last year, trying to fill some of those holes. And uh, not to be overstated, Sam McGath for Bemidji, had himself a game, certainly seems to have cemented himself as the guy for the Beavers, obviously coming off the loss in wake of Brandon Alt last year, the former single caller for that Beaver offense. He had 149 and three tuds through the air. How about 128 and an extra touchdown on the ground? Like the definition of a dual threat guy, he was doing it all for Bemidji State. Absolutely hell of a game. Let's move over and just continue talking. Minutes about this uh, Division II slate and a game that we talked about last week, UTPB number 15 in the country, formerly going into the Thunder Bowl at CSU Pueblo. This one started off very, very strong for the Eagles. And I will, uh, I will show you why. All right, here's a reverse, and now it's going to be a flea flicker. There's a pass downfield. A receiver is wide open, and that is going to be caught. <laughs> 10-5, and that's going to be a touchdown on the first play of the game. And just like that, Bates and up six. And if you heard him right there, you heard him right. Touchdown on the first play of the game. Texas Permian Basin pulls out a little bit of trickery to start things off. I'll show you to you one more time. The handoff, a little bit of a pitch in reverse, and it turns into a flea flicker. Got him open down the middle of the field. So... Take the lead early. That's kind of where things got derailed for this uh, Texas Permian Basin squad. They start, uh, excuse me. 7 nothing. This one ended up getting a little bit out of hand. It was 29-9 to before halftime. CSU Pueblo had an offensive explosion. Uh, Reggie Retzlaff was back with two more touchdowns. He has been on an absolute tear for the Thunder Wolves. He's been very fun to watch play football the last couple of weeks and has just been dominating defenses. UTPB comes back, has a touchdown to open up the third quarter. They make things interesting about a 13-point game there. CSU Pueblo responds immediately, and this game was kind of wrapped up. Uh, Permian Basin tried to add some things on late just did not have the firepower to keep up with Pueblo and kept getting gashed down the middle of the field. Stat-wise, 
Devin Larson for CSU Pueblo, 21 for 35, 287 and three tuds. Did have the one interception through the air. Um, but Reggie Restlap, once again, seven catches, 164 yards and two touchdowns. He can't be stopped. He literally cannot be stopped right now. And he, I would say he can't keep getting away with this, but he might. Like, he might literally just keep getting away with this. <laughs> but let's keep things moving. Let's talk about Northwest Missouri State at Nebraska Kearney. This Northwest squad, they lose their home opener to Mankato, and now they have to go on the road to a Nebraska Kearney squad that people are, you know, maybe a little bit high on. They found out, guys. They found out 14 to 21. They dropped this one to the Lopers. From Nebraska, Kieran, I got some highlights to play from you uh, for you. Excuse me, as we take a look at this one, Northwest Missouri. They were still holding the number twenty-two uh, ranked team in the country, holding that title. I would uh, think say it's pretty safe to say they will not be ranked. They will fall out of the top twenty-five after this week to uh, losing to an unranked UNK team. Here are the highlights from this weekend. And as we take a look at this one. Where did the struggles come here? Northwest Missouri State, they had two interceptions through the air. And uh, Chris Runke, he's 25 for 38, 311 and two touchdowns. He had a great day, but those two costly turnovers, well, they did just that. They cost them a big part of this game. And when you look at Northwest and their offense, they ran for 32 yards in the day. A net total of 32 yards on 26 carries. For you mathematicians out there, it's 1.2 average per rush. That is not going to win you a lot of football games at this level. We know that. Um, they had two fumbles in the day as well, so they're turning the ball over and uh, just not something they're going to be hanging their hat on if you're uh, that Bearcat offense especially. So a really disappointing start of the season for this Northwest Missouri State squad. Not to be overshadowed, though, this Nebraska Kearney squad. What a great way for you to show out in this matchup. And uh, take please, guys, take a look at this. He's really cool. I can't tell if he looks like he belongs in a Disney movie or if he belongs in like Five Nights at Freddy's, this mascot for the Lopers. He's kind of terrifying in an endearing way, if that makes sense. I don't know how I feel about it. Just a normal-ass dude in football pads with a full antelope headgear piece. I'm going to leave that at that. The history of this matchup I do think is, uh, is semi-worth mentioning here in that... Nebraska Kearney has not won in this matchup since 2019. And most of the games, I mean, last year in Maryville, Missouri, it was 56 to 7. They got boat raced. So this is a big time statement win. I don't know how many times I can say it for this Loper squad. I mean, the, the win this for the first time since uh, since 2019, I think I said earlier. Um, that's really impressive. Now, two more games to talk about at the Division II level, the first of which we'll go over quickly. Bowie State at number 13, Lenore Rhine. And I think the uh the star of this one is probably the running back room for Lenore Ryan, and, and we'll show you and talk about it to, to let you know why. Here's some of the, the highlights from this one and the Bears under uh, new head coach Doug Socho over there. 32-19, to 19, Lenore Ryan picks up the win in this one. This is a pretty thorough victory, guys. Like This was 23-6, 29-6, 32-6 into the third quarter. Bowie adds on a couple scores late to make things interesting, at least in the box score, but this was a really one-sided victory for them. They held Bowie State to under 100 yards passing, or 100, I guess, exactly passing on the day. Um, but again, the stud of this game, you see him there, and that would be Xavion uh, Turner Knox, excuse me, 30 carries, absolute bell cow statistic for 200, uh, 204 yards, excuse me, three touchdowns. He's averaging almost seven yards a pop. What a way to, to come on the field for a guy who I'm, I have to check here real quick. He is, uh, he's a junior right now for the Bears, and he is having some big time performances out there for them right now. He was the star of the game for them, definitely in the running for our Player of the Week type nominations. Now, uh, Sonja Yates, he had five catches for 109 yards as well. The quarterback, Jalen Ferguson, 17 for 27, 270, and a tud. Did have a pick on the day. This is the Nor Ryan squad, definitely back, certainly going to be in contention at the top of the SAC down there. The SAC has uh, some other great teams in there, but this Lenore Ryan squad, if you're going to make the pick today, they might be the one to lock it in for conference champions. Who knows? A lot of football to be played. They're playing a really good brand of it right now. Finally, on the D2 slate, as I take a breath here, I apologize. I need a drink. Um, 
a non-alcoholic one, just a little bit of water. Uh, <laughs> Central Missouri showing why they are one of the top-ranked teams in the country. 63-21 to win over Northeastern State. And this Northeastern State squad, we had Coach Chivarini on here earlier. There's obviously a lot of buzz about what he's got going on down there in the quad. Tequila, 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 Oklahoma, excuse me there. I'm getting delirious talking too much. Zach Zabrowski goes out and has a fucking day. The kid under center was just putting up ludicrous numbers. I mean, 38 for 48, 503 yards, six touchdowns, no turnovers. Those are video game numbers from a guy, the reigning Harlan Hill winner. We've come to expect that, but even still when he does it, it's just as insane to me every single time. The Mules rolled to a 63-21 victory there over the River Hawks and... Kind of a victory I expected, but nonetheless, an impressive one at that. Some other scores around the league or around the country, I should say, worth mentioning. Charleston comes out of a close one, 23-19 over uh, California PA. Davenport, a relatively close contest with Thomas Moore. They clawed their way back into it. Finley goes on the road, picks up a big win at Truman State, 37-21. Otherwise, Lock Haven, don't look now, they started the year with a win over Glenville State. Slippery Rock takes care of business against the reigning NE10 champs of New Haven, 22-7. to And those are more of the kind of the biggest scores from around the league. We will uh, transition over to talk some D3 football at Jimmy Martin. Let's start with Division Three Week 1. We can actually do a little bit of recapping now. Some ball has been played. We're here to talk about it. Jimmy Martin joining me for this portion of the episode. Jimmy, an exciting weekend, my friend. And, and we can start with a game that admittedly we were wrong about. How about that? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I was looking forward to this. Um, you know, obviously, like I said last week, it's not like I wasn't high on Oshkosh. I was just a big believer in Whedon. Um, and I was wrong. Uh, the Oshkosh, the, the Titans took him down 21-14. I think that was due to the absolutely stellar defensive run game for Oshkosh. You know, they kind of struggled last year a bit stopping the run. And being that they were going against a really formidable opponent, uh, Whedon and Giovanni Weeks and uh, also Mark Fercucci, you know, a good athlete at quarterback. You'd think that Wheaton would have ran the ball a little bit more. And I saw there were a couple fans on our Twitter thread that were also pretty upset about that. So I uh, definitely wanted to make that known. But uh, Oshkosh definitely impressed. Uh, Bryce Edwards had a heck of a game. He had 11 tackles, I want to say, maybe even more. But, uh, yeah, he really impressed me a lot. And uh, look for Oshkosh to continue to play well. They got Linfield next week, which is not going to be an easy game. But I think Oshkosh will be up to the test. Yeah, I mean, what a day for the WIAC in general. Obviously, we'll talk about Whitewater and River Falls later on. I mean, uh, the, the top part of that conference, man, looked really, really solid, and this was just kind of the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, we had some question marks about the offense. Obviously, you lose uh, Berghammer. You lose some pieces on the outside, a couple weapons. And uh, we definitely need to be reminded that Tetzloff still a guy for them. He came out and scored uh, the opening touchdown in this one. Not just a regular opening touchdown. He was a 63-yarder. I'm sure we'll get to it in the tape here in just a minute. That one kicked things off. But this was very back and forth. Uh, there was never more than a one-score lead at any point in this game. I and mean, like you said, 21-14 to final. Still a relatively low-scoring kind of contest. Did uh, Oshkosh surprise you in any way here, uh, like you had talked about offensively? Um, I, I thought they would have scored a little bit more points on offense, honestly, because they had a really good offense last year. But like we said, they we lost they lost a little bit on offense. But you know, twenty one points against a pretty solid Wheaton team is going to win you the game, probably half the time. But it, but when you pair that with a really good defensive performance, holding them to fourteen, you know, I mean, like I said, if they, if they can't score, they can't win, and uh, that's what Oshkosh did. You know, they held them on the scoreboard. So. Yeah, and they bounce back. I mean, as a roll in the tape here, you see an interception early down in the red zone. That could have been killer for them uh, early on, but then they bounce back with this one right here. I talked about it earlier. That big touchdown pass propelled them to an early lead. Wheaton would tie it up at seven apiece, and then a, another absolute bomb from Oshkosh. This time, though, to John Matthew. That made it 7-13 to 13 with a missed extra point, uh, I do believe. But they go on to, uh, to score with 16 seconds left. In the game, Jimmy, Justice Loveland, a one-yard run right on the goal line. And uh, that touchdown, obviously, put them ahead. And, I mean, that really was kind of the biggest takeaway for me. It was answering a lot of the question marks from a team that I know we had a lot of them going into the offseason. But uh, Quinn Keene, 11 for 22, 270 yards, two touchdowns, one pick. Talked about that one in uh, in the red zone there. That It could have hurt them, but they bounced back. He was sacked four times on the day. 
Not something that I'm sure they're very proud of over there. But um, once again, if you're able to overcome that kind of adversity against a quality opponent in Wheaton, that's something to definitely uh, to be proud of. No, for sure. Absolutely. And the, another thing that's interesting about sacks, you know, <clears throat> it's one of those things where you got to see the film. You know, you got to see like where you protected it. Maybe maybe it's not always the offensive line's fault. Not, yep. all, not always the quarterback's fault either, you know. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting because I'll probably end up getting that tape here in a few weeks. So it'll be interesting to go back and watch it. Because it's you obviously you can see it watch the game like on the stream but yep you get that all 22 look it's a little bit different so there's that second bomb to Matthew down the left sideline and uh Oshkosh was airing it out and that was something that maybe I didn't expect from them uh maybe I was just wrong and stupid to think that they definitely were were, were finding their stride in the passing attack but uh what do you uh, we're not we're not going to jump into previews or try and do that at a, a later this week but uh next up Linfield on the docket for this Oshkosh, Oshkosh squad excuse me uh what are you expecting there uh, obviously a really close game. And I expect Oshkosh's defense to uh, be tough again. You know, I think Linfield was, what, number 23? I'd have to double-check that, but I believe Linfield is also ranked. So this is not going to be an easy game for Oshkosh. I'll be interested to see um, what the Hanson ratings put this game at. I have a feeling Oshkosh will be favored after that game last week, but yep. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't a very big spread at all. Probably made it maybe, like, if I had to guess. And again, I haven't looked. I'd probably say, like, Oshkosh like minus – four and a half or four, maybe three and a half. But uh, again, I'll have to look at that, but. Yeah, and then Wheaton has uh, looks like a bye, and then they'll get Augustana on week three, so that'll uh, certainly be a tough contest. But they get a little bit of time off there to uh, maybe reevaluate and try and figure out what they got going on, on on both sides of the ball. There, let's move on to the game that I think we were really excited about this weekend, man. River Falls. And number 17 in the country before this weekend, going into then number seven, Alma, the Scots. That defense, we talked about it, man. When you have to replace you know, 11 seniors on that side of the ball, there are going to be a lot of question marks. We saw that early on. What were uh, some of your impressions initially off the rip from this one? Uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, I mean, you got to obviously look at Blaha throwing for 426 and having five touchdowns. Absurd. Time. Ridiculous. Uh this was our Division One Rejects game of the week for a reason, and it was everything we anticipated. Uh, 41-35, absolute slugfest. And I think we learned a lot about the Palma as well. I mean, you know, anytime you give up 41, you're going to be like, ah, like, it's not that good. But, man, River Falls is a really, really, really high-powered offense. And, you know, I'm a hung in there, man. I think they, they kind of surprised me a little bit. The fact that River Falls didn't cover the spread kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I'm like, yep. wow, like, and like I said, I thought Alma was really, really good before this, but I they actually, I mean, I know they're probably going to slip in the rankings a little bit, but I don't really even think they should. I mean, this that Alma team is tough, man. You know, obviously, this game was twenty-seven to seven, and at a time it felt like, oh, I, I, I honestly like, I never was going to turn it off. You know what I mean? Because I was still excited to watch this game, but it was one of those where I maybe wasn't checking in on it quite as often because you kind of uh, check out of it a little bit. Twenty-seven to seven, they come back and. Admittedly, the final score is a little bit deceiving, right? 41-35, it wasn't quite that close. Alma fighting back late and trying to, you know, put together a touchdown there late. But uh, that still goes to show, like you said, that defense, they had a lot of things to figure out, trying to keep up with the up-tempo version of of this Top Gun offense, they like to call it over there at, uh, at River Falls. And, and watching the game, too, uh, you notice, at least I notice, when they're making those substitutions and the refs are actually slowing down that River Falls offense because they have to allow for the substitutions on either side of the ball. Did you notice some of that? I feel like it, it even slowed down, maybe hindered uh, River Falls offense just a tad. Yeah, I know. It, that's the thing when you run a hurry up offense, you might run into things like that. But um, hey, I mean, <laughs> and you, you, you can run an offense and still score 41 points. I don't even you can call it hindering, I guess. But man, yeah. man it, it, I, don't think it, I don't think it mattered too much, if I'm being honest. No, I'm with you there. And blah, final stat line. 27 for 39 through the air, 315 and three tuds. Did have well, the one interception, but then on the ground, 21 carries for him is is quite the astounding number, I think, from my perspective. And uh, 114 yards on the or 111 net, excuse me, yards on the ground with an additional two touchdowns there. He is a workhorse, and that entire offense has certainly gone through him. Were you at all concerned with how much they were running him, and, and maybe some of those hits he was taking? Because that is that's a, quite the workload. Yeah, but, like, when your best player can run for 100-plus yards and throw for 300, it's like, I mean, you got to run that kid, man. Like, I saw it live in person last year. You know, I see the film. But, I mean, when you see the kid playing right in front of you, you know, his speed's a little bit different, man. He's a really, really good football player. And I expect nothing nothing more than uh, 
they're <clears throat> nothing, nothing else. I should say. Yeah. Part of nothing me. less. For sure. I expect and, a lot more actually as we go here. Because obviously, you know, yeah. your biggest jump is from week one to week two. Obviously, yep. that's like the the cliche everyone uses, but I think it's just nothing could be truer. You know, because you you come out week one, you run like your base game plan, right? And try to like see what works, and then week two you take that big jump schematically, and I think you're gonna see a lot more. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they, they'll probably hold off a little bit on like the show and like all their crazy new stuff, but you would um, think, yep. But maybe come time for why I play, you're going to see uh, some different looks from River Falls because they have just such a versatile offense. Yep. A hundred percent, man. A, a big out of conference win like that against a nationally ranked opponent. I mean, what that does for them is, is a lot, right? And uh, Carter St. John, with potentially the quietest 257 yards and four touchdown performance that we've seen uh, in, in quite a long time. Usually we'd be talking about him in the other side of the ball. And obviously that gets overshadowed because you don't get the win, but Ty Lauterman on the outside, 11 catches, 117 yards and two tuds himself. How about that? Have a day, two other receivers and uh, French yeah. go. We've talked about a lot on this show. And then Jordan Williams, a name I'm not familiar with uh, maybe as much also hauling in a touchdown for the Scots, but uh Still a lot of great things for that Alma team down the road and, and a great test for them early on. I think it's just going to help them build. The Falcons, though, cracking the top 10 in the AFCA poll. So they jump, uh, I believe that was seven spots in the most recent poll. I think uh, a worthy a worthy jump in your eyes, Jim? Absolutely. And I think, you know, like I've said earlier, you know, these rankings aren't always like power rankings necessarily. There are sure. a lot of uh, – you incorporate like – how it went last year and stuff, but I don't think River Falls is the 10th best team in the country. I think they're better than that, but we'll find out the rest of the year, right? Won't we? And also backtracking a little bit, Ty Lauterman was my uh, teammate for a summer softball league two years ago. So <laughs> shout out to Ty on his great game. So I had to mention that for sure. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Buzzy. Oh, we got the, yeah, we got buzz. the buzz. <laughs> Good old buzz, baby. <laughs> he barking over there. He's a Ty Lauterman fan as well. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about a game that uh, we talked about earlier. We had Carson on the show, and this one, Jimmy, we talked about it. Number eight, Johns Hopkins going into number 20, Ithaca on the road. Coming out with a win is one that maybe we kind of expected, but not in the fashion that we expected it. We had said the Bombers were going to need a turnover or two, going to have to make some things shake and maybe have Lady Luck on their side for this one to kind of stay in this one, and then it would come out of the fourth quarter, and that certainly was not the case. Ithaca comes out 17 nothing with the first punch. Johns Hopkins very much the team playing off their back foot. What did you see in this one? It was definitely a little bit of a wake-up call for me. You had this one on and watching it early. Yeah, you know, uh, obviously we talked about how Ithaca had a 17 nothing lead, and that was not the only safe 17 nothing lead of the weekend. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Chicago Bears game. They were also losing 17-0 <laughs> and came back to win, but uh, that's a different subject. But I just wanted to put that out there, bear down. But um you know, absolutely. Like, John Hopkins, we were talking about how they're high-powered offense. They were going to come out and score a bunch of points or show the experts thought. And then we kind of said, it'd be, uh, like, that if the defense is tough, and obviously it was, you know, for that first half, you know. 17-6 to six at the half, um, that was kind of, obviously, like you, like you said, it stood out to you. But um, they, they kept fighting, fighting, chipping away, and chipping away, and lo and behold, you know, they came out with a victory. Um, that touchdown on that front pylon was a heck of a play. with like seven minutes left in the fourth quarter. Just yep. a spectacular catch um and then obviously you know the, the game winning pick too so uh just a really really great game by uh i mean Ithaca fought man they just they're gonna be pretty upset about that when you know losing that lead but um they gotta hold their heads high man they're they're a really good football team and john Hopkins is, as well you know you come in there and you play them and you go up early against this big team and man it just kind of just kind of stinks because you know i picked Ithaca to win as well but um man Johns Hopkins definitely tipped the cap to him. They played a heck of a game. They did, and, and to be able to bounce back, you know, for something like that, I talked about that um, with Carson, and you go down 17 nothing. but not only that, you don't get any points at all in your first three possessions. It was a punt, a turnover on downs, and then a punt again. And at some point as an offense, you're like, Guys, we got to figure this thing the hell out. Like, like, what do we have going on out there? Are, are, are they scheming us very well? Or is it something that we're doing inside of our huddle at this 11? Is it some kind of the play call or anything? What's going on, right? And trying to put your finger on that is a lot easier said than done. They are able to bounce back. They do that in a big way. They actually go and score 20 unanswered. Take the lead 2017. Uh, then this one late had the interception from Carson that uh, him and I talked about to kind of seal the deal there. Also worth noting, of course, first win for I use air quotes with new because he's not new to the program, but new in the uh, is in the role that he is in. Head coach over there, Dan Wadica. He is uh, 
one and zero, Jimmy, as a head coach of the Blue Jays. That's a a pretty exciting start to your to your head coaching yeah. journey over there. You'd say so. You know, sure. He's probably thinking like first head coach, and then you go down seventeen nothing. It's like holy cow. It's not how you want to start, but hey, it's all about how you finish, right? So heck of a yeah. win for the for the guy. You know, that's great for him. That is uh, that is definitely a big one, and um, you know both these teams have some have some games come up. Ithaca though versus Endicott is one that's going to be pretty exciting. Endicott's team that's kind of yeah. come out of the scene uh, these last couple of years. Johns Hopkins uh, goes on the road at Christopher Newport, which I think we're expecting the Blue Jays to continue this success. But again, you never know. Yeah, I uh, as you're talking about the Ithaca Endicott game, I was looking through for my write up because I was doing like next player. I was really excited when I saw that game. That's going to be a heck of a football game. The Ithaca and Nikai game. I'm really pumped for that. I have a feeling that might be one of our games of the week, you know, that we talk about next week. I don't know. We'll see. I like be. that. I like that. A game that uh, potentially was not as uh, as much of a football game and that it was more mm-hmm. of a one-sided beatdown. UW-Whitewater, they host John Carroll 34-7 to is the final in this one, and and one that I think we were both confident that Whitewater would come out and, and perform the way maybe we expected and go out and win, but when you bring in the number 19 team of the country, Jimmy, you are not supposed to beat them to that degree. What did you see in that one? I had that one on. Uh, that was one on the TV in, in my living room over the weekend, and I was, I was quite surprised, honestly, and maybe I shouldn't have been, I mean, but I, I was quite surprised at this one. Um, I was... I mean, I can't say I was surprised. I thought Carol, John Carroll would have cut it, cut it a little bit closer. But um, this was just the most whitewater football game ever. I mean, they just came out, <laughs> played great defense, really physical, really tough, and they ran the football really effectively. Um, you know, I I was a little disappointed with John Carroll's offense, but, you know, it's really hard to go into Perkins Stadium and score a lot of points. You know, not, not a lot of teams can do that. And uh, John Carroll's not going to have it any easier. His their next opponent will be Mountain Union. So. Yeah. They're yeah. Whitewater Mount Union. That's a tough, tough, tough start to the year. Purple but, powers back to back, dude. Yeah, back to back. Two top five teams mm-hmm. right off the rip. You know, it's uh, but like that'll make them a lot better because you know, obviously, if they drop one game in conference and win out, like eight and two might get you in still. So we'll see how it goes for John Carroll for sure. Yeah, but hey, again, they could also beat Mount Union. Who am I to talk? You know, obviously, I don't, I don't know anything after what I talked about Oshkosh last week. So. <laughs> and even this score, thirty-four to seven. I mean, it was thirty-four to nothing, and yeah. uh, they actually John Carroll did not score until the final second of the game in the fourth quarter. Uh, Tyron Montgomery, four-yard touchdown pass there, with literally a second to go to get the uh, John Carroll the streaks on the board, and that was. Uh, it just feels that feels terrible. Like, yeah, you obviously you want to get yeah. some points on the board. It looks a little better than a shutout, man. But this game was they really did pitch a shutout. Tamir Thomas uh, was back in a very big way for this Whitewater offense, and they really just looked like they had things, you know, figured out. And you know that was uh, something too. And he wasn't even the main. He had the the majority of the workload in the backfield. But Brian Stan, he was the one that had 123 yards and a tud on the day. So he had some some pretty big chunk plays as well. One of them being a 56 yarder. So that was a big piece for them. Didn't have a ridiculous amount of overall yardage. Their quarterback Jason Senti was 14 for 25, 153 through the air and a touchdown. Uh, not incredibly efficient. Not incredible numbers, but. They just got it done. I think the defense was a much bigger takeaway. Not that the, the offense didn't perform well, but this defense for Whitewater came out and was legit dominant uh, on Saturday. Yeah, and I'm sure they're pissed about letting it score up on the last play, too. I know they wanted that goose egg. Yes. They definitely wanted that goose egg. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Carmen Hutt with the uh, interception for Whitewater also had a couple of sacks on the day. Lucas Sadler was in the back uh, backfield a few times, a couple of TFLs, same with uh, Trey Costella, Jacob Simmons, those guys all getting back there disrupting plays. So again, another, another WIAC squad. I know we talk about them, but there's a reason we're talking about these squads, man. They are doing some, they are doing some absolute damage and uh, we can switch out of the WIAC here and talk about a game that honestly, I don't think either of us expected to be talking about this episode. That's Texas Lutheran going into number 13, Trinity, Texas, the Bulldogs with a big time win over a nationally ranked Trinity squad. Jimmy, that was uh not an expected outcome on the road too. like, come on now. Like, and they the beat him by two scores. Who was a 35, 20. I mean, I I think yep. Texas Lutheran is going to be on our radar quite a bit more this year than we anticipated. Um, to be honest with you, uh, I did not even know about this game until you told me. Did you see the Texas Lutheran game at what, like six o'clock? You texted me today. 
And I went through the scoreboard. I'm like, holy cow. Like, they went into Trinity and beat them. Like, that is, <laughs> that's like, that's fantastic. I mean, that's great for those guys. Um, obviously, a huge, huge, huge win. Um, I mean, hey, you get a win like that early. It's kind of, this kind of reminds you of like Northern Illinois going into Notre Dame and beating them. It's like now yeah. you have this, this momentum behind you. And no one was expecting you to win, and you go in there and kind of kick their ass by 15 points. That's pretty impressive, man. So, heck I would of a definitely game. For say Texas. so. When you look at the history of uh, of this matchup as well, I mean, Texas Lutheran has not won this matchup since 2016, and they wow. haven't played a ton since then. But the last three meetings have uh, have all gone the way uh, of Trinity and the Tigers. And the last two of them, Jimmy, I mean, 2021, it was 51-14. 2022, it was 52-14. These games were not even marginally close. Texas Lutheran comes out with a very new and improved squad. And granted, Trinity has lost some big pieces. Like, let's definitely not uh, overshadow that. This Trinity squad is going to rebound. They're going to have some big-time players still. Uh, they lost some big-time pieces in that defensive core, especially that linebacking core. You look at the quarterback and some of the offensive skill positions, there's definitely some gaps there offensively for the Tigers. But... Throw that all out the window. That's still a really good football team, a nationally ranked one. And Texas Lutheran goes in there and uh, kind of has their way with them, like you said. They go up 14 nothing to start things off. Talk about being punched in the mouth. And, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the, really the, the big takeaway, I guess, for me. They also outpassed Trinity. It was 240 yards passing to about 170-some. Sheesh. Big time. Now, Texas Lutheran yeah. did not do much on the ground. 43 yards rushing on the entire day. Worth noting, definitely. And yeah, there's a couple other 35 yeah. rushing attempts. So they rushed 35 times to get 43 yards. So the rushing attack, and more, maybe more, more so the rushing defense from Trinity, uh, had themselves a day, but that gets overshadowed by the score and maybe that pass defense, some of the holes there. Yeah, you know, there's actually a few games in Division Three where the team that won didn't really run the ball very effectively. I think that's due to having, like you said, a really good defensive scheme and um, <clears throat> just having – like a really good pass game, really good playmakers on the outside. No. So you got to be know how to exploit a defense for sure. And they couldn't do other, it with their run game, but they did it in the pass game. So a couple other big numbers from this one, Trinity nine penalties for 105 yards. Feels a little uncharacteristic uh, for the Tigers there. They had four fumbles, two of which were uh, recovered by the other side over there. And uh, Texas Lutheran got to the quarterback four times. That's a big number always. Time possession was still relatively even. Again, it's a, it's not a, much things that jump off the box score here, but you look at that score, and they were obviously doing something right. So, yeah, kudos to that Texas Lutheran squad. And uh, I think those are most of the big-time games that we wanted to go over. There were a couple other scores that were definitely – I think at Shout least out to Calvin for their first win as a program as well. Of course, yes. How could we? Uh, how could we forget Calvin football with their first win? First, I believe technically first varsity win in their program's history, and they did it in a big time way over over, and they put a fifty bomb up there. That was something that was uh, quite impressive, and I'm trying to. I'm grabbing the the video here in just a second, but a little bit of a Gatorade bath after that one. The Calvin Knights got things rolling. I uh, admittedly did not have this one on this weekend. It did not make the slate on my living room TV. Did you get to see any of this one? I did not either. So shame on us, you know, huh? We got we got to be honest on Division One redirects. We can't be lying. <laughs> I did see the uh, the Wabash hundred hundred plus yard uh, fumble return touchdown. And my my grandpa James Hannah Martin the first well, was a Wabash Little Giant. So I always have a little soft spot for him. I like that. I like that. I'm always cheering um, for the little giants. Uh. Yeah, I'm pulling up the, uh, sorry, the box score from that Calvin game because the offensive performance from, from from them was not something that we were expecting against an Oberlin squad that we knew probably wasn't going to be uh, of a very high caliber, if you will. But for Calvin, if you're putting up 50 points against anyone, I think that is uh, oppressive and impressive. Excuse me, enough in its own right. Chase Bradman for Calvin, 18 for 31, 173 yards and four touchdowns. Maybe not the most efficient, but uh, scoring a lot of points for them. They split up the load in the backfield quite a lot. The quarterback had 10 carries. You had uh, Jair Harden, looks like, with 15, and then Jackson Cook with 10. So spreading that out, there were actually... Look at that. There's almost 10 different knights that got a carry on the ground in this one, Jimmy, which 
I mean, that happens when you get up big time in some of these games, especially for a new program where you're trying to figure a lot out and get a bunch of guys in the field. Had uh, a couple guys over 50 yards. Hunter Hogan with two touchdowns on the day for the Knights as well. And then some big time defensive performances. How about Trevor Martins with two TFLs? One of those was a sack. And then two interceptions from Dylan DeHoop there, big time. And uh, they had three on the day as a team. Three different guys getting to the quarterback for sacks. So I guess a long way of saying definitely a group effort for this Calvin squad. And I, it's going to be very interesting, I guess, to see where the ceiling is for this group as they move on throughout the year. They go this next week. They're on the road, actually, for the next three weeks at Concordia, Wisconsin, then at Anderson University in Indiana, and then at Kalamazoo. And that's when they start their uh, conference play in the MIAA. So we will see what the ceiling is for this Calvin squad. Certainly the bar isn't incredibly high because guess what? There is no bar. Uh, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But uh, definitely going to be exciting to see what their ceiling is, Jim. For sure. We'll be, we'll be cheering for them on D1 Rejects, at, for sure. You know, we like those new teams. We like those new programs. You know, we'll be cheering for them, absolutely. And we talked a lot of WIAC on the show already, but we'll, we'll mention it briefly. Lacrosse, 35 nothing against an RPI squad that looked just demoralized. Yeah, no surprise there. Jack Suter with arguably the catch of the year already. That Even was ridiculous. Saw that one is just, I mean... That's it's good. It's good stuff. That's a great play. Over the shoulder, one hand. It was kind of like the George pick and catch against the Browns on Thursday night, but it was with his left hand instead. So yeah, nope, a hundred percent. Otherwise, wild. trying to think anything that uh, that jumps out. Of course, we did have that wild finish to was it the Bellhaven Millsaps game? Yeah. Oh my, the snap. Oh my gosh. To, to take him out of field goal range, like dude, that is such a nightmare. Not even take oh, out of field goal range. Most taps recovered and then won the game off of it. No, I know. In either way, like that, like having that ball go all the way back there and like fumbling around with it, like oh. yes. Here we go. I've got the. Uh, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that clip here because I, that's definitely worth showing. I know we tweeted it out, but um, I'm not counting on everyone having, having seen that. I'm trying to think. I thought I had it pulled up here. Yeah, Excuse you posted it on Twitter. It. I know that, but that was oof. Was that Isn't 28, that just... 26 or something the final one that? Something like that? I don't know. They're on, oh. like, the seven-yard line, man. Oh. Maybe not. I couldn't find it. But, yeah, basically, uh, you know, down by one, all you need is a field goal. Bad snap over the head of the quarterback. First of all, just go under center. I mean, <laughs> right? I don't, I don't I mean, yeah, it's easy to say that. Like, most teams are, like, all shotguns. Like, I mean, you're right. I, you're right. If, if I'm an OC, I'm not just going to be like, okay, let's go under center. I mean, unless you're going to, like, just – Play, run a play like center you just run it to the center of the field and slide and get in the middle of the field or something maybe very I'll fair but on the goal line though but, you will see a lot of teams that make that change but yeah that was that was brutal that was a brutal ending yeah. i hated watching that and i have no affiliation with either of those squads not me either i didn't even know those teams existed to be honest to you before <laughs> you know, like i said we got to be honest on the show and like it's it's fun we these games like pop up like oh like who's who these guys that is the good part cool. about this though you get teams yeah. on people's radar that uh maybe they weren't familiar with um, you know, a little bit prior. So absolutely, man. Well, Jimmy, I appreciate you. And uh, we'll look forward to doing some more pre previews here later in the week, brother. Always happy to be on the show, Kobe. Let's close things out with the NAIA slate to talk some real ball here. Matt Schwarzler joins me. We've real got ball. new rankings, bunch of new ball, and uh, some incredible games this weekend. Uh, so many good games that we actually had to double up on our uh, game of the week selection. How about that? Yeah, absolutely could not go wrong with the two choices that we had, but there were even a couple other games that were up there for contenders. We can probably just start it out going off the top of the list, Georgetown against Pikeville. Um, obviously, Georgetown coming off a tough loss the week before to Montana Tech. Pikeville also needing their get back against, I believe, Campbellsville in a tough loss. Um, both, you know, Georgetown was ranked in the top five. Pikeville is receiving votes. Big game for both of these teams and Georgetown claws out after going on a 99 yard drive down the field to punch in the game winning touchdown with two minutes and change remaining and the big difference in this game for georgetown like we did not see last week from them against montana tech uh garrick sluniker had a very good day through the air did not turn the ball over was efficient uh Derry Steele also showed up albeit not a triple digit day like we're used to seeing from him but he was productive had a touchdown to his name and the QB duel between Sluniker and Kirkland was really fun because Kirkland also, you know, Sluniker had two touchdowns and 262 yards, but uh, Kirkland for Pikeville also had 34 for 30 or 34 for 47 passes, 319 yards and three touchdowns through the air. 
Yeah, man, this uh, this Tiger offense was dialed in. You watch them, uh, you know, this some of these passing concepts, getting their guys, their playmakers out in the outside in space and just dialing up some deep packages too and going down the sideline like you were talking about, very efficient in, in that regard. How about also 9 of 12 uh, on third down in this one? Mm-hmm. So the passing attack is definitely very potent for Georgetown in this one. Had a, a solid rushing attack going as well. Their rushing defense held Pike uh, to 69 yards on the day, so that was something that uh, they can definitely hang their hat on. They did not punt in this entire contest as well, which is not something you usually associate with 23 points, but the way the game kind of panned out. Yeah, the way it shook out. Yeah, it just kind of happens sometimes, you know. (laughs) Um, I think, too, you mentioned, like, the big plays. That was huge for Georgetown. Uh, Jamarcus Robinson uh, being a huge factor there with nine catches for 171 yards, and both of uh, Sluniker's passing touchdowns were to him. Had an absolute monster day. It was just a very well-rounded attack from Georgetown. This was a bit different because the defense did falter a little bit where we saw them be very rock solid last week. So I think especially something... early, right? I mean, you yes. go, you know, yeah. you go down early deficit, 13 nothing. You Pike comes mm-hmm. out and, and gets on top, and then they would score uh two scores of their own to even things up. And uh, you know, when you have that passing attack, and don't get me wrong, they had a decent rushing day, a little over 100 yards combined, but you had almost 34 minutes uh, time of possession, which is a really yep. big number. And which, when you're going to the air for a lot of it, is is a little bit surprising. But they just sustained a lot of those drives, and um, it was that 99 yard drive that definitely helps. They had the, well, like a 64 yard uh, completion yeah. to, to close that one out. That definitely <laughs> helps. But um, what yeah. a big. Uh, I guess bounce back week for this uh, this Georgetown squad and and just continuing to build. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I think a big difference too is you just look at penalties in this game. Georgetown only had three for twenty five yards, and Pikeville gave up a hundred yards of penalties, okay. which is yep. a field. So you know you can equate that to a however field. many points you'd like. Um, but penalties, huge thing for Georgetown that they were able to control, that they won that part of the game. So. Good on them. They get their bounce back. Pikeville's still looking for their first win of the season. Will be interesting to see how they recover. Absolutely. And then a team that uh, we had talked about last week, even had one of the linebackers on, Texas Wesleyan, man. We we were excited about this matchup with uh, with Ottawa going into this one. We knew it was going to be a tough contest. Didn't know it would be a two-point contest. They uh, The Rams take the win here, 35-33. What we see in this one? Yeah, I think it's important to note, too, that uh, this was off the tail of a very, very quick uh, Ottawa-Arizona comeback in the fourth quarter. Yes. Uh, Texas Wesley and held the lead for pretty much the entire game and kept their distance one or two scores at a time. Um, but this was a very late clutch up for them. So, um, obviously, a very good game. Uh, Ernest Caesar for Texas Wesleyan, putting up seven rushes for 69 yards and four touchdowns on the day. That'll do it. That's Hello. not bad at all. Um, and AJ Bob in the air uh, on the receiving end, uh, eight catches for 193 yards. That'll also get it done. That's a lot of yardage. Yeah, um, man, this was 35 to 20 with eight minutes left in the fourth, and it maybe felt mm-hmm. like this was kind of put away if you're a Texas Wesleyan fan. And and they came out and had you know credit to credit to uh, Arizona. They had some more fight in them and, and put up a couple more scores, albeit too little, too late. But the score ends up being, I mean, pretty damn close. Absolutely. And that was off the back of Luke Guyron having a really good day through the air. He went 19 for 29 for 188 yards and two touchdowns. Also a factor in the ground game. But on top of that, Terry Warner the third was his main target on the day with five catches, 61 yards and two touchdowns. They were moving the ball pretty efficiently. This is an Ottawa, Arizona team that is known for its high powered offenses. The defense obviously came to play. They did pretty well. But that Texas Wesleyan offense and that team in general, I've just been singing their praises all preseason. You heard me talk about them last week. I think this is a top 15, top 10 team in the NAI right now. And uh, they're climbing up the poles. So thankfully, like people are starting to see that. But man, this was a big game for them because it kind of sets the precedent for the Sooner Conference going forward. Texas Wesleyan has the one up on Ottawa, Arizona. So what will likely be two of the top teams in the conference, there's already one of those games down. So we can already start to build that picture. 
Absolutely. And we talked, you know, Carson Rogers obviously having a day through the air, but they were they were doing it all. That offense was very multifaceted. I have the clip up here, the touchdown in the third quarter, right on kind of the goal line of them being able to punch the thing in. So um, mm-hmm. still a good bit of physicality to this squad under the new head coach and Coach Sherrod over there. And uh, and that they bring that over to the defense too and talking with uh, Shelly Cannon last week and, and getting to hear from him kind of the mindset defensively for the Rams. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of really good things going for these guys. And when you look down the road for this squad heading into the next couple weeks and uh you know it's not that not that they're like any kind of gimmies but when you're coming off of number 20 and number 16 and Lindsey wilson and ottawa arizona respectively to go at home against north american university is probably a a little bit of a sigh of relief for this ram squad yeah, absolutely. Um, and this was a this was a Rams team too that just did not dodge the smoke at any point last year, um, even this year. Just their mentality going into the season, like this is a team that wants to prove a lot of people wrong, and that's exactly what they're doing. They look really good. They look really well rounded. Like just going for a man. It's good stuff. Absolutely. Let's go out to the frontier. One of our favorite conferences to talk about mm-hmm. on this particular program, Carroll College. They play host to Montana Tech. This one, just uh, as exciting as usual, I guess. Talk about another late comeback, uh, so to speak, in this one. 30-7, to Montana Tech heading uh, into the fourth quarter. Carroll would have a couple scores to make it semi-interesting, but uh, still a pretty convincing win for the Ore Diggers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for 80% of this game, this was all Montana Tech. Carroll obviously taking advantage of Montana Tech, maybe taking the foot off the gas halfway through the fourth quarter. Which, when you're up 30-7, to seven, not ideal, but I could see why that happens. But on the day for Montana Tech, their defense really showed out for most of this game. Anthony Oaks at the defensive line for them had six tackles, and three of those were sacks, which is, holy cow, that's really good. Um, also, on the flip side, Carroll College was also playing some pretty solid defense. I know Montana Tech got out to an early lead, but once uh, Carroll's defense kind of locked it in, they did really well. Uh, great excuse me, Braden Orlandi for Carroll College, their DB, had nine tackles, a tackle for loss, and an interception, still contributing on that side of the ball, keeping a minute. And obviously the late score was snuffed out by Montana Tech. Um, On the offensive side of the ball, I wouldn't say there was a lot of uh, big plays happening, but it kind of was a ground and pound, like good old-fashioned football type of day. It was a battle of the running backs. Obviously, Lander Smith, who we talked about last week, had 29 attempts for Montana Tech. 110 yards, 3.8 yards per carry. Not ideal, but you're giving him the rock enough to where he's getting okay yardage, um, you know, and they won off the back of that. So good for them. And also Carroll, you know, they're running back. Mr. Ford had 20 attempts, 144 yards, 7.2 yards per carry, much more efficient day on the ground for him and a touchdown. So it was, uh, it was old school, old fashioned football, just how we like it. It's wonderful. Cannibalism in the frontier once again. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, part of those points for the Ore Diggers early came off of that block punt that we saw in the highlights yep. here a little bit uh, just a bit ago. And they obviously able to capitalize a touchdown off of those points. That's a big turning point in the game where, you know, every possession obviously matters in, in, in any football game. But in this one particularly, when you have a blunder mm-hmm. like that on special teams is not something to hang your hat on. And when I'm looking at these clips, man, watching the stadium and the atmosphere, I had to do a double check of uh, the attendance just under 6,000. For this yeah. one, you couldn't convince me that this was eight or nine, the way this <laughs> stadium looks right now. They got people lining the hill. This place looks like a really awesome atmosphere. Uh, and uh, you go in and kind of win in that environment says a lot about this squad. Absolutely. Carroll is one of those classic NAIA programs, man. You talk about a committed fan base there. Um, it is incredible. Just the, sh- the turnout they get, the support they get. They're always playing in big games. This is like one of their down years and they're receiving votes and competing against the top teams in the country. This is a storied program. And for Montana Tech to go in there like they did and convincingly win for most of the game, like yep, pretty impressive stuff from them. So I, I like seeing how Montana Tech is building upon the success they had last week against Georgetown. They look really good. They're rolling. And Carroll, I think, too, can uh, bounce back from this. They're a really good football team. And something tells me we're going to be talking about this Ore Digger squad a lot in the coming weeks. Yep. Um, Eastern Oregon on the road this coming week, but then you go at number 10, College of Idaho, in a matchup that we've come to expect uh, fireworks in. Uh, back at home for homecoming at Southern Oregon, and then back on the road, number 8, Montana Western. This yep. has got to be up there for one of the tougher schedules across all of the NAIA because 
I mean, you know most of these games coming into the year, but then you add a game like a Georgetown, like that kind yep. of deal, just to supplement what's already a really uh, beefy in-conference frontier schedule. We're going to be talking a lot about that squad, but we can move over. How about number 22, Louisiana Christian, and number 12, St. Thomas, Florida? This is a one-sided Ooh. Yeah, this was a bit one-sided. I talked in the preseason over at NAIA F-Ball when we did our season preview, um, season conference previews, excuse me. Louisiana Christian had a lot of seniors and fifth-year guys last year, uh, which contributed major uh, things to how well the team did last year. But since those guys left, it was kind of up in the air. Um, and we kind of got our, okay, well, this is what we're getting because – uh, this was all St. Thomas. St. Thomas absolutely demolished them. They're ranked in the top 10 after this win, which St. Thomas is a really good football team. I'm not saying this to like discredit Louisiana Christian at all, but Louisiana Christian has problems to work out. They clearly lack the pieces that they did last year uh, to make a game like this competitive, like it would have been likely last year. Um, St. Thomas is just rolling. Obviously they are tired of playing second fiddle to Kaiser and they want their shot at them. Yeah, and they got to yeah. do that by getting through some of these other teams St. Thomas is another one. You want to talk about not dodging the smoke, man. All these teams. That's what I love about the NAI. Everybody wants to play the best. St. Thomas is another one of those teams. Obviously, Louisiana Christians in the Sooner. You don't usually see them. Yep. This is also a St. Thomas team that played Texas Wesleyan um, not that long ago in their preseason or their uh, pre, uh, conference pre conference. Slate. Yeah. 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 I should say. Um, this is a team that wants to win and they want to prove that they're the best. Uh, this team probably is playing with some kind of chip on their shoulder. I'm excited to see how it goes. It's just unfortunate that such a promising Louisiana Christian team that we were so excited about last year was the recipient of this uh, beat down. Beat down. Yeah, that's putting it nicely. I think Keely <laughs> Watson and Rontavius Farmer's stat lines for the day kind of telling the story. Rontavius Farmer, they're running back 20 attempts, 130 yards, 6.5 yards per carry, and three touchdowns. And oh, yeah, Keely Watson also threw for two more touchdowns. 253 yards on 12 completions and David Hayes, the main receiver on the day for St. Thomas with five catches for 123 yards and a touchdown. Man. Oof. And on top of all that, the uniforms from St. Thomas are pretty top tier. I don't know if you've, mm. you've seen those, but mm -hmm. the, the combo they've got with this Navy and like, I don't even know if calling it maroon might be a disservice, but whatever that shade of red yeah. is they got going on with the pants is just so a really nice. clean look. Definitely top tier, and uh, I'll admit I was not on game when it comes to uh, knowing about those. Uh, Big Cliff, no, I guess coming off this one as well, St. Thomas, they cracked the top 10 in the rankings, and I guess it's probably a good time to segue over and talk about those a little bit. They get into the top 10. What are some other teams that uh, made the jump and, and maybe some big moves in the rankings this week? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, I mean, we talked about Southern Oregon kind of being a part of the gauntlet in the frontier. They're ranked this week. They're 23rd yep. in the country now. Um, kind of the sleeping giant program of the NAI uh, early 2010s won a lot of championships did a lot of good things kind of died down the other teams in the frontier obviously with how competitive it is you know they weren't around for a while weren't super competitive but they've been climbing back they have a really good roster the the voters are obviously starting to buy into that for them so that's really good Texas Wesleyan also finally making an appearance at 19 yep. there you go. Um, I think they should be much higher but hey you get in um when I thought they got screwed in the preseason poll so that works um Ottawa Arizona dropping eight spots from number 16 to number 24 Lindsey Wilson also falls to 25 a few spots Georgetown um, down eight as well yeah, from three Georgetown. to 11 that's a that's a, a shot yeah, the Mid-South, the top three in the Mid-South, which is Bethel, Tennessee, Georgetown, and Lindsey Wilson, all in a very weird spot, especially when these are all usually top 10, top 15 teams from what we saw last year. Um, they Their out-of-conference hasn't been very favorable to them, so I'm very curious to see how that shakes out between those schools. But yes, Georgetown dropped, Lindsey Wilson dropped. I think Bethel, Tennessee moved up a spot because they obviously had that fantastic win over uh, Mary Harden Baylor, which was super impressive for them. Yeah. So they get to move up. They get the that advantage. And also Kaiser staying at one. But I should mention they won in overtime uh, on the road. North Greenville, yep. Against North Greenville in very impressive fashion. And they're going on the road again. I forget who they're playing. They're playing another D2 team this week. Again, these NAI schools, man, they will play the best that they can get. It's awesome. I love that. And all with uh, a new head coach, too, to go on mm -hmm. to go on top of that. Obviously, Coach Sochi, he goes – um, up to uh, Lenore Ryan, correct, to make yep, that jump up correct. to the D2 level. And uh, they had a big-time performance this week, but uh, his former stop is uh, apparently doing 
quite all right without him. And that school that you're talking about is Newberry College. Once again, on the road at Newberry. Newberry actually gave Valdosta a little bit of a scare. Valdosta is a top five team right now in Division Two. So, yeah. I mean, you, you can play that game, I guess, all year long of, of who beat who and, and kind of evaluating. But when those first couple of weeks, it almost is like, kind of what you have to do because it's really hard to judge some of these teams when we have very limited knowledge of the off season and what that entails. But yeah, I mean mm-hmm. that Kaiser team to go and and have that result uh, against a quality division two opponent was something that maybe I think a lot of people weren't expecting great wake yeah. up call for people to understand that the defending national champs are, are not just going to go away quietly into the night. They still got a lot <laughs> yeah. of ball in them. Absolutely. And I think too, it's important to know with Kaiser, they have a new head coach, but miles Russ is a guy that has been around this program for years. Yep. This is his sixth or seventh season um, is what he's coaching in right now. This is just his first as the head coach. He knows his stuff. He knows his team. He knows how to get the train rolling. He was here since pretty much day one for this squad. So um, program's definitely in good hands. You could see it in the results. I mean, they are still the best team in the country, in my opinion. Uh, I think Northwestern's up there too, but man, still Kaiser's to lose, but we are so early in the year. Like who even knows, right? Who even knows? Absolutely. Meisinger's still in the backfield, right? Yep. Then Absolutely things are is. things are still shaken then. Yeah, they're things fine. are things are <laughs> still rumbling. Fine. Uh him being <laughs> him being one of them. Let's talk about our other game of the week selection there. The insane overtime finish. Taylor, they take down Olivet Nazarene. 58 51 fireworks, my man. Absolute fireworks. And this was an Olivet Nazarene team too last week who pretty convincingly beat down on Concordia uh of Ann Arbor, who I was pretty high on. Absolutely. Um, but Taylor, man, wow. I mean, getting it done in that fashion at your home stadium. And Taylor, the past few years, like, they haven't, you know, they haven't made a lot of noise. So them getting a big-time win like this against a storied program like all of it, Nazarene, is super cool to see. Obviously, in a high-scoring belt like they had, 58-51, to 51, that is just some of the best football you can get. It's absolutely amazing. So uh, Taylor could really run – could take this win and get a few more out of it, which would be – rarefied air for them they could start 3-0 4-0 their schedule's favorable enough I think this would be the first time in a long time they'd have that good of a start yeah I mean this one the scoring I mean it's pretty self-explanatory looking at this but Olivet they scored first and they did it twice so start on the back heel was Taylor then they'd respond with two touchdowns of their own each team would both have two more touchdowns in the second quarter and this one yep. uh going into halftime here I have to I have to go over it. it's my screen's getting cropped, but going into halftime, like the score, you're already up into like the thirties. And it's like, wow, this, yep. uh, I don't know what the proverbial over under was set at this, but I, hopefully <laughs> everyone who, uh, bets on NAI football hammered the over, uh, yeah. If you bet on NAI football, you need to call the hotline. We I'm probably sorry, should. Yeah, we, we probably should say we, that. <laughs> you, you need help and it can't come from us. It goes be it's that's above my pay grade, man. But yeah, I whatever the over under would be for this game, it was definitely The over. fact like someone I don't even know you would go out of your way to find a bookie to even like give you a line like Every once in a while you stumble upon some random really small like gambling Twitter account or like a website that's really shady that's like Dakota Wesleyan's minus three this week against get it's like dude really like <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of some it. some cross divisional matchups how about this Bethel mm. squad that goes yeah, in and man. takes what is seemingly a depleted Mary Harden Baylor squad but still a quality win for that yes. team out of Tennessee absolutely and this is this is definitely a win they needed because they have some I don't want to say rough times ahead because they're still a very good football team yep Um, but they have to answer a lot of questions, um, similar to what Lindsey Wilson and Georgetown have had to do. It's just, they haven't been confronted with that yet. So this was a good game to get in to see, Hey, you know, let's face a quality opponent. Um, we kind of don't know what the gauge is here for a D three game. So curious to see that too, where the team stacks up and got the job done, man, looked really good. I think they have the advantage right now in the mid South with Lindsey Wilson and Georgetown being down again, anytime you can add Mary Harden Baylor to your, uh, win list, it's, uh, it's a good day so yeah that team's come under a lot of fire i mean dude they had over 200 kids heading into camp mm. you know that one yeah that's a ridiculous number yeah <laughs> how do you even what do you do with that many people at like a practice or anything of the sort yeah and i i know because i oh gosh i i'm gonna go on a story here so you can cut this out if you want um <laughs> when i visited linfield i okay. visited there 
um on i was very much gonna go there until i visited dakota wesley so i went on a few overnights there um their roster was i kid you not 220 people you're joking i'm not joking dude and it was game day and so since it was a home game they all ran out of the tunnel since it's a home game everybody gets to run out of the tunnel wow so you see this team coming out of the tunnel and they just it's like a clown car dude they just keep rolling. They just keep coming out. And the majority probably aren't even suited up. <laughs> I think they all are. No. <laughs> if I remember, most of them were unless you were hurt. Like, they're still suiting these guys incredible. up. That's incredible. warm-ups. It was, dude, the post game when I was talking to the coaches on the field, I couldn't move. <laughs> There's too many people on the field because you got to think, 220 guys plus their families plus the visitors and anybody who came to see that, dude. That's oh one God. way to make an atmosphere. Oh, it's it's a great atmosphere. Absolutely. But dude, way too many bodies. <laughs> you could like it's hard to say that you would get lost in the shuffle at a college football program. Yes. But like it's possible with that many people. You know what I mean? <laughs> that sucks. I mean, it's it's just that's really tough. For the D3 level, yeah. sometimes you run into that. Um, we can finish on not as uh, not as much of an up note. Your Dakota Wesleyan squad, their finish. That was. Uh, a bit yeah. lackluster. I'll let you. I'll let you do the storytelling. Yeah. There. So I gotta. I gotta paint the picture here because I lived through this. I didn't actually live through this. I was watching a live stream because I no longer play for my alumnus that I love so much, Dakota Wesleyan. Shout out Tigers. Um, they were up seventeen to fourteen against Mount Marty, who's a hated rival. And Mount Marty gets the ball back. Dakota Wesleyan punts after going three and out or whatever. Mount Marty gets the ball back with a chance to score at the end of the game. There's like a couple minutes left, right? So they're driving. They're driving, and then boom, saving moment. Quarterback goes to the right front corner of the end zone. Interception, Dakota Wesleyan. Awesome. Okay, cool. Mount Marty only has a couple timeouts left, right? That's great. So all we have to do is down the ball and bounce a couple times. We'll be good. Granted, ball's on the one. So, like, not the easiest situation in the world, but you're up by three. So a safety isn't the end of the world. Not ideal, but not the end of the world. They only have two timeouts. So when it gets to third down, if you're still in bounds, just go down and you win, right? So uh, they get the ball out of the end zone to the one. Timeout, Mount Marty. Same thing happens again on second down. Third down, third and 12. Uh, the quarterback takes a snap from shotgun, runs like left off the left guard or something, is in bounds, is getting pushed by the old line because, sure, it's third down. Like, you're getting pushed to the first down. Why not? Sure, whatever. And the quarterback is stumbling, fumbles the ball. Keep in mind that if he would have gone down, the game would have been over. Yeah. So no you just run clock left. at that point. I yeah. Mean, it's, yeah. So it's he inevitable. fumbles the ball. Mount Marty picks it up, th runs one play to either take a shot at the end zone or like readjust for the field. I forget which one it was. Nick it was one of those two. Kick, right? Yep. Yeah. And then they line up the kick, get the kick, goes into overtime. Mount Marty gets the ball first. Two play touchdown. Dakota Wesleyan's game ends on fourth and short. And they lose. Oh. Turf monster. Painful. Grass monster? Turf monster. Turf monster. Turf Tokyo monster. Turf. We were prepared for the weather out there and stuff. It was one of them. Oh, it's a rough watch. I love my boys. I'll always back them, but should also note, I got to give props where props are due. This is Mount Marty's first ever win over Dakota Wesleyan. Wow. In, in football, ever, ever. I didn't know that. So... Yeah, because Mount Marty started the program just a few years ago. Okay. We beat them the couple times I played them when I was there. They beat them last year. And I think they had a football team in like 1907 or something <laughs> stupid, and they played a couple games that we won. So the joke that was running was that Mount Marty has – well, first of all, Mount Marty has never beat Dakota Wesleyan in football. But also, Mount Marty has never beat Dakota Wesleyan in football in over 100 years because that makes it sound <laughs> a lot worse. We no longer have that claim because of some – Football buffoonery. Would you believe it? <laughs> so, I sh I think that's worth sharing because it was, objectively speaking, a very fun and good ending to the game. Just so happened to be against my guys, which I don't appreciate. But hey, if you if you if you got the time, I don't want to say go watch it. I was to say, are you are you feels, advocating to go and to go say? <laughs> well, like maybe look up the box score just to see how that like. It's worth your try eyes and see it through his yeah, yeah see it through yeah, your eyes it's, too it's 
extremely intriguing. I know that those boys are going to steer the ship the right way, but man, that is a brutal way to lose. <laughs> it is. That it is. Uh, oh, God. They'll be back. More opportunities next week for yes, all sir. these squads. Yep. D-Dub included. But Matt, thank you once again, my man. Really appreciate you coming on here. I've had a blast talking ball with you, brother. Anytime, man. Anytime. Have a good rest of your night, man. You too. I'll see you. See you.